one of my greatest joys to have a front row seat to watch what God is doing in the lives of our littlest Chapel Streeters. And I want to invite you to join. God wants to make an impact on the next generation. And now, more than ever, kids need to hear the truth of God's Word, learn the love that He showed us when He sent us Jesus, and be reminded of who He created them to be. You know, I think sometimes we might assume that someone else will fill that need, or it's not me they're looking for. But let me assure you, if your heart is willing, we have a spot that's just right for you. We want you to be aware of our most critical needs as we move to having full kids ministry at three services at our Kesslinger campus. Adults are needed in the nursery, in the preschool and elementary classrooms, and there are their roles for helpers and teachers and small group leaders. One-on-one -on -one buddies are needed for our Masterpiece kids and students. This ministry is making a giant impact in our community, and new families are joining every week when they learn that Chapel Street has a place for them. Then, after a really special BBS week at our North Aurora campus, we're launching Adventure Club there on Tuesday nights. We believe that this will be another avenue that God will use for impacting that neighborhood. So if you have a couple of hours available on Tuesday evenings, helping in crafts or game time or leading a small group, we could really use your help. Every week I hear stories from our volunteers telling us what a blessing it is to serve Chapel Street Kids and Masterpiece Ministries. So we'd love for you to say yes to this invitation. And there's a kiosk right outside in the lobby, folks there that will help you find a spot that works for you. Well, you heard Paige say that uh, this morning's topic is on uh, going to serve and giving. And then you heard, uh, you saw the QR code where you can scan to find a place where you can find out more information about serving. And now you've seen a video asking you to get involved in serving and you know, you know that we're gonna talk about giving. And I'm sure some of you are like, oh, I should have stayed home this Sunday. It's a, I, I hope you can hear me say, the, and I, I know what it's like. I get emails asking for things and I delete them immediately. We probably do the same thing, right? Uh, this is an invitation into the life God's called us to live. And there's no guilt, there's no obligation, there's no pressure. It's simply an open door, an invitation for you to get involved. Um, you probably already know, as we've been talking about, that we're launching three services. We're adding a service here. Because we say often at Chapel Street Church, we want to be a, a church not just for ourselves, but for our neighbors. Which means making room for them. It's increasingly difficult to find a seat if you come in as a family of three or four or whatever. Uh, and, and we want to make space for our neighbors. So our new service times beginning October 15th are 8, 9.30, and 11. Now, I know how it works because I barely pay attention to when I'm supposed to be home, who I'm supposed to pick up. My wife has to remind me all the time. That'll take about a half a year for most of you to get comfortable with the new service times. Some of you will be really late to things and early, that's okay. But these are the service times beginning October 15th, 8 a.m. Some of you are already up anyway, so come early. Here's what we need. We need a lot of you who are regular, who call this your church home. You feel like this is the place where God's planted you and you will be part of the mission of God here to choose the early or the late service to make space for the most convenient hour, the middle hour for our guests and visitors. And if you can, please pray about serving on that middle hour. It will make a huge difference. Uh, we need to do this together as a church. So anyway, that's the information. We'll be saying it until by the time we're sick of saying it, you'll just be getting to hear it. Right? That's how it usually works. So, so pay attention, 8, 9.30, 11 a.m., beginning October 15th, making space for our neighbors as we come to worship God together. Let's pray before we come to God's word. Father, we pause now and acknowledge that you are the giver of all good gifts. Everything we have is a gift of your grace. Nothing is ours by right or because we deserve it, but you pour out your grace on our lives through Jesus. We forget that. We think it's all about us. And so thank you as we worship you, you remind us, and now through your word. The greatest gift, of course, is your son, Jesus, in whom we have life and hope of eternity. So speak to us, Jesus, who is the living word. Through your word, we pray in your name. Amen. Uh, many years ago, um, this is over a decade ago, it was late in the afternoon, I was working in my office, and there was somebody came to our church door, and I was one of the only pastors still in the office at the time. This guy was uh, asking for help. And you could tell just by looking, he was in a desperate situation. He was clearly um, in hurting. Uh, he said he'd heard that a church like ours would help him, that we would help people like him. And, um, and this is before we had our Shepherd's Heart new facility at our South Street campus. This is when it was in a different location and a smaller operation. And Aaron Wise, who runs it, wasn't there at the time. And I had strict instructions what not to do, but I didn't really listen to those. And so anyway, he asked for help. 
And I, uh, I went, knew where Aaron kept our, the Meyer cards. Some individuals from our church would often drop off, uh, remember this, Aaron? Shoe boxes of Meyer cards, uh, $25 each, to give out to people in need. And I knew where she kept them. So I looked in the drawer, and there were four left. And so I gave them to him. And he was stunned. 100 bucks in, to, to, to Meyer. Uh, he, t- he, said, he thanked me profusely. He said he's been living out of his car with his girlfriend, and he would pay it back. He would, he would definitely pay back the kindness. I said, you don't have to. Why don't you come back on Monday? We'll help you further. Never saw him again. And I never thought about it, really, quite frankly, after that. Five years later, roughly, I get an envelope in the mail, a big, thick, manila envelope. Inside was a handwritten note from that guy saying that he has a job in construction. He was married. He's living in a different state. They're part of a church family. And inside Rubber Banded were 20 $25 Meyer cards. And he said, I think about that day at your church every day. I hadn't thought about it once since that day. He said, I was on the verge of giving up on my faith, on God, on life. It turned, God used that to turn me around, he said. And I thought about that many times since. Catch that. Simple act of generosity that I wasn't really thinking about and didn't think about since. But afterwards, the power of a, sim- a single act of compassion, of service, of generosity. We don't often get to see or hear the results of those things. But I would just suggest to you as we go through this, no act of compassion or service or generosity done in the name of Jesus is ever wasted. Whether you see the results or hear about them or not. God used that moment to redirect his life. And I think about those who would drop off those Meyer cards in our church, not knowing what it would do, who would be blessed. Today we wrap up our series called Pathway to Purpose, looking at the life God has called us to, not what God wants from us, but what God wants for us. It's an important distinction. Not just more stuff to do, but the life, the invitation of Christ into the life that he's called us to live, a life of joy and fulfillment and blessing, free from selfishness, on mission for him. We looked at this corporately, the purpose of the church in the world, and individually, our part to play in the church. And today we wrap it up, we'll look at the last two of these six G's. You'll see the image of the six G's here. We think this hexagon represents, uh, it symbolizes the life God's called us to live. We gather together for worship because not that you can't worship God privately, but something powerful happens when his people gather and proclaim his name and lift our voices in praise and in prayer and hear his word proclaimed. And then we also share the gospel with those around us when we have opportunity, giving a reason for the hope that we have in Christ. And we grow individually through word and prayer. And we connect in groups for encouragement and accountability. We can't walk alone. And today we come to the last two, go and give. Here are the statements for each of these. As followers of Jesus, we understand that God has work for us to do. And we believe that he has called us to go and serve our church, our community, our neighbors, and our world. To follow Jesus, you don't do that passively. There's action involved for the good of others. And then to give. As followers of Jesus, we believe that God is an incredibly generous God. And we understand that when we give generously, it reflects his heart. It makes an impact in this world. And it is good for our souls. Years ago, we preached a series called Generosity, and the, 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 the tagline was, some of you will remember this, freedom from smallness of heart. I love that definition. Generosity lies at the heart of everything God has done and is doing in the world. For God so loved the world that he gave. He gave. What did he give? His only son that whoever believes in him should have life. He gives an invitation to life through his son, Jesus. In Mark 10, 45, Jesus puts it this way. For even the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. He did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. At the heart of Jesus' mission in the world is service and generosity. I came to serve, not to be served. 
all the pagan gods, the Roman gods, the Greek gods of the time, it was humanity serves divinity. But Jesus says, I came to serve. Divinity serving humanity. A complete reversal. And to give. His very self. So if we are going to follow him, how would we think we get a pass on this? To live like him in the world, at the heart of our mission, which is his, is to serve and to give. These two words encapsulate the heart of Jesus. Whenever and wherever the church has been vital and influential in the world, it has been service and generosity at its heart. That has been the case from the very beginning. Look at this passage from Acts chapter 4, verses 32 through 35, a description of the early church, the early believers, our spiritual ancestors, if you will. Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own. But they had everything in common. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. There was not an needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to each as any had need. This beautiful little snapshot of life in the very first church, the early church, an amazing description. They had everything in common. We talked about this several weeks ago when we launched this series. Common is the Greek word koinonia. It doesn't mean that everyone thought the same thing about everything or they were all clones or they're all exactly the same. There was great diversity in that early church. People from all over the Roman world. But what they shared in common was Christ, which transcended all those things which would, that would otherwise divide them. It held them together. We're, we're in, a, in, in, in right now in our culture, in American culture, we desperately need, as followers of Jesus, to be held together by the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because there are a lot of forces trying to pull the church apart, Christians apart. I've said this, and I say it frequently because as a pastor, I want you to hear it. We're heading to another election season. I don't know if you're aware of that. Maybe you've had your head in the sand. You live in a snow cave or something, right? And you, you better believe there are going to be forces twisting and turning and pulling on us. What will hold us together? What holds us together? Jesus and the gospel of Jesus Christ. I frequently hear people on the left and on the right saying, if your pastor doesn't say X about Y, if your pastor doesn't believe this, if your pastor doesn't, if you don't, if your church doesn't, we have one message here, friends. It's Christ. He holds us together. Anything else takes his place, it pulls us apart. I love this description of the early church. Don't make the mistake of thinking they're all just exactly the same. They were not. Different socioeconomic strata, which was unique in the Roman world. Different ethnic and cultural backgrounds. But what held them together was Jesus. And what motivated them to live this way was Jesus. Here's the question then. How does the gospel of Jesus Christ impact the way that you think about or view your time and your resources? Every act of love is an act of giving and generosity. And I think in, in, our, in our culture, the two most precious things in our lives are our calendars, our time, and our money. They have the strongest hold on us. They do on me. So how does the gospel of Jesus impact how you think about where you spend your time and where you give your money? Spoiler alert, it should impact them. <laughs> like if you're thinking, well, it doesn't really. There's a big disconnect, right? I just come to church, I like to be inspired, but that's my business. You cannot follow Jesus and expect it will have no impact on how you think about where you spend your time and your money. Okay, first, a little backstory to this part in uh, Acts 4, uh, beginning of chapter 4. So uh, Peter and John, they are uh, arrested by the Sanhedrin. This is the Jewish high council that uh, strong-armed Pontius Pilate into crucifying Jesus. They're the most influential religious and political uh, cultural leaders in, uh, in Israel uh, at the time, in, in Jerusalem certainly. Peter and John are arrested uh, and put on trial. They're warned and threatened with their very lives for preaching in the name of Jesus. And basically they say like, well, we can't help but say what's, what God has done for us, so you do what you must, but we can't stop. Like, we, we have to obey the Lord. And, they, they, and they're threatened with their lives, and they then go back after they're released to the church fellowship, 
to the koinonia, the, to the, the life together with their other believers. And what's interesting is when they get together, do you know how they respond? Think about that for just a minute. Let's, let's imagine for a minute that Pastor Brian and I are arrested for preaching the gospel. It seems unthinkable in American culture, but it's been the case at times in, 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 in world history. And we come back to a church meeting and we report back that we were threatened, we have to, if we don't shut these things down, right? What would be the response of the church? We'd like to think, no way, not us, we demand our rights, whatever, I don't know. But look at how the church responds. It won't be on the screen, I'm gonna read it for you in Acts chapter four, which I think is just, it's really instructive for us. When they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and the elders said to them. When they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, Why did the Gentiles rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and his anointed. And they go on, and then listen to how it finishes. And this is their praying. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your servant, Jesus. What do they do when threatened? They watch their master, their rabbi, their teacher, their Lord die at the hands of this council who threatened them. And they go back to them and they say, look, we, and, and what's their response? Prayer, praise, worship. And what do they pray for? They don't pray for security. They don't pray that God would tear the Romans down. They don't pray for a protest. They pray for more boldness, more faith, more courage. That humbles me and convicts me. They, pray for, they don't pray for themselves. They pray, God, give us more opportunity so that more people would know who you are. And after they pray, the text says the place where they were was shaken, trembled. The presence of the Lord, tangibly, physically, spiritually felt. Maybe the simple point of that is when God's presence comes in power, things shake. And the result of this powerful spiritual shaking is an explosion of grace and service and generosity and proclamation. All the G's we've been talking about. Look at verse 33, Acts 4, 33. And now, with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of Lord Jesus. And say this last line with me. And great grace was upon them all. This phrase, great grace, in Greek, Mega charis. Literally, mega grace. I love that. <laughs> and great grace, mega grace, mega charis was on them all. Grace, the favor of God, the smile of the Almighty on the people of God. Motivating them, filling them, empowering them. So think about it. They preach about Jesus. They're threatened by earthly authorities. They pray for more boldness. God shakes that place and great grace is on them to live out their mission in the world. To serve and to give and to share. When you experience the mega grace of Jesus, it changes you. It changes you at the very core. It changes how you think about your time and your money. Those things closest to the core of who you are. From You go from, and I'm in process just like you, from this is mine, I own it, I earned it, I deserve it, and I need it, to all I have is his. It's a gift of his grace. It's not mine. And, and, I'm, and I'm given it for a purpose to, to bless others. What changes someone from that to that? Mega grace. In verse 32, we read that nobody said any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. Now, uh, it's, not that they, they're, it's not that they didn't have possessions. Nobody said the things that belonged to him. They had stuff, but they didn't think of it as just mine. 
How many of you had to teach your children the word mine when they grew, were growing up? <laughs> what was that? Was it Finding Nemo? The seagulls? Mine, 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 mine. Remember that? That's just in my head, right? We, we, we don't need help learning how to be selfish. We, we sort of come into the world thinking that way. Mine. I, I remember like you, my, uh, my, uh, my youngest son, Ben. Right? So I would offer my kids candy sometimes and like Noah, would, he's the oldest and, the, and the, old, the oldest son. He'd slowly take whatever he wanted, not worried about anybody taking from him. My daughter, Hannah, well, she's the favorite middle child and the only daughter, so she gets what she wants, you know. But Ben being the youngest, like he would like look around, who's coming, just grab it and run, right? Mine. <laughs> Protect yours. It's in us. So this is not some sort of like a, a biblical case for socialism. Socialism says what's yours is mine. But koinonia, grace says what's mine is yours. There's a very big difference. This radical generosity and compassion was the credibility for their witness. Their, their generous lives of compassion and service were the, earned them the right to talk. In other words, they're talking about the grace of Jesus and living out the grace of Jesus. And this was recognized in the ancient world. And by historians who study the explosion of the early church, like what was, what was the secret sauce? How did it happen? There's a story about uh, Emperor Julian, the, the, the grandson of Constantine the Great, Emperor Julian the Apostate. They call him Apostate because Constantine became a Christian and the empire was increasingly Christianized. But he was uh, the grandson of Constantine the Great and he led a campaign of sorts to uh, bring back paganism. He was not a Christian. And he was observing that the Christians were growing despite his efforts. And it annoyed him to no end. And we have a portion of a letter, a missile he wrote to a pagan priest, basically saying, if we want to succeed in this project of, of, of reinstituting paganism and the Greco-Roman gods, then we have to behave more like the Christians. Here's a portion of that letter. We ought then to share our money with all people, but more generously with the good and with the helpless and poor so as to suffice for their need. And I will assert, even though it be paradoxical to say so, that it would be a pious act to share our clothes and food, even with the wicked. For it is to the humanity in a person that we give, not to their moral character. Hence, I think that even those who are shut up in prison have a right to the same sort of care, since this kind of philanthropy will not hinder justice. Think about what he's saying there. Where's he getting these ideas? For it is disgraceful that when no Jew ever... He referred to the, the Christians as Jews because they... It was a sect of Judaism and the Galileans. When no Jew ever has to beg and the impious Galileans support not only their own poor, but ours as well. All men see our people lack aid from us. Essentially, he's saying, look, if you want to win people's affections and, and a right for your message of paganism, you got to behave like the Christians. Because they're taking care of not only their poor, but ours as well. I think this is fascinating. Let's live like the Christians. Where's he getting these ideas? Why are people listening to these strange Christians? Because of the way they live. Their lives of service and compassion and generosity. Because they go and they give. This is what you do when you experience the mega grace. That's the portion I think Julian was missing. Look back at verses 34 through 35. There was not a needy person among them, for as many were owners of lands or houses, sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. Not a needy person among them. Deuteronomy chapter 15 tells us that the, in, in the people of God in the Old Testament, there was a process, a system of canceling of debts and of care for the poor within the people of God. That our compassion and generosity starts here. And I think sometimes as Christians, we, we, we care about the poor out there or the needy out there. In, inside the family of God, we should care for one another's needs and also extend it to the world. In the community, we see that there are wealthy people selling possessions and giving it to the apostles. So they're, 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 not, they're not arbitrarily deciding who gets what. They're bringing it to the leaders of the first church and asking for a system of distribution to care for the needs of the poor. And there are people in need, relatively poor, receiving financial help. Rich and poor together, 
in community. Koinonia. Scott Sauls says this, he writes this, uh, Christianity always flourishes most as a life-giving minority, not as a powerful majority. It is through subversive countercultural acts of love, justice, and service for the common good that Christianity has always gained the most ground. I want you to hear that again. Christianity flourishes most as a life-giving minority, not as a powerful majority. There's a lot of talk in American culture today about the loss of religious freedoms and our rights. And I would be the first to acknowledge that there are concerning trends in the culture. But don't forget, our history as the people of God in the world is not as a powerful majority, but a life-giving minority. We should not fear it. It's where we come from. Gracious, compassionate, gospel-proclaiming, fearless in our service and love, often from the margins, that wins people, that makes the biggest impact. And these early Christians were simply responding to the great grace in their lives. This is always the best motivation for giving and for generosity. Barna Research uh, did a study of uh, the state of giving in America among, uh, for charitable giving in general, but for specifically Christian giving, but it looks at just generosity across the, the spectrum. And there are lots of things that, to make you uh, feel less optimistic, but a couple of really, I think, hopeful uh, statistics from this study, which I've, in 2021 I read in, in, uh, in its entirety. Uh, we'll sh see them here. Reasons U.S. adults give. Why do you choose to give? I don't know if you can see this or read this from where you are, but on the far left is I give because of who I am. The other reasons, because of the ministry asking, because somebody asked me. Because uh, I give because of why I'm asked. It's, it sounded good to me, the, the reason. Uh, I give because of the person, my relationship with the person asking. I give because of how I'm asked. All of these are about the asking. On the left column, which by far and away is the greatest motivator, is because of who I am. That's a hopeful sign. I give because I've been changed. This is who I am. I serve a generous God and he's changed me. I'm, I want to live a generous life. Nothing is stronger than that motivation. In the next slide, 54% give because they've received generosity. They've been the recipient of someone else's, like the story I opened with. Somebody was generous, extravagantly, radically generous to them. They were on the receiving end and it changed them and they want to be the same for someone else. These are gospel motivations. We've received the extraordinary generosity of Jesus, his mega grace, and we want to be like him. The Apostle Paul makes this same point in his second letter uh, to the Corinthian church. We'll look at this passage, 2 Corinthians 9, verses 6 through 11. This deserves a whole host of sermons, but we'll cover it briefly. The point is this. That's helpful, isn't it? Sometimes you ever read the Bible and think, well, what's the point? Well, he's telling you, the point is this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you. So that having all sufficiency in all things and at all times, you may abound in every good work. As it is written, he has distributed freely. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. That sounds like it's talking about God, by the way. That's a quote from Psalm 112. It's actually talking about the righteous person who lives the way God has called them to live. The next line is Isaiah 55 talking exactly about God. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. Paul could really write. God's generosity toward us is for the purpose of our generosity to others. The point is this. Notice some of the words that he uses here. He uses negative words, sparingly, right, and he uses uh, reluctantly, under compulsion, for the negative side of giving. But he also, he contrasts that with different motivations. Bountifully. In his heart. 
cheerful, abound, all-sufficiency. Paul's contrasting two different motivations here for giving. Which do you think best describes how most people think about a sermon on money? I don't think I've, I'm. I don't think I'm reaching too far. I think most people, when they come to a church and they hear the sermon on money, they, you, their defenses go up. We, we think it's going to make someone's going to make you feel guilty, obligated, grudgingly. There's nobody standing at the back with a bucket trying to make you give. But I want you to do a little self-examination of your own heart. Which describes, which list of words describes how you feel about it? Which describes what God actually wants for us. Friends, God is not after your money. He doesn't really need it. He's after your heart. But he knows that our money and our time have a hold on us. And that's why Jesus says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The word for cheerful is a Greek word. Hilaros. It does not mean hilarious. It means uh, free from uh, guilt, or, or, or not begrudgingly, but full of grace. So how do you become a cheerful giver? Well, he says, God is able to make all grace abound to you. Having all sufficiency, he will multiply and increase the harvest of your righteousness. Sadly, some, some preachers have tried to sort of twist this, I think, into a, 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 a false meaning. That if we give to God, then he gives to us. Extra. Like I give, usually to some online ministry, right? And then I, then I receive. And God will bless me with a miracle, with more money. But that is not the motivation order that the New Testament authors talk about. Which doesn't mean there aren't benefits for generosity. There's always blessing in serving others and in giving. A great book I read last year called The Paradox of Generosity. Here's a quote from that book. A variety of kinds of practices of generosity are positively and significantly associated with five important good life outcomes. Giving money, volunteering, being relationally generous, being a generous neighbor and friend, and personally valuing the importance of being a generous person are all significantly positively correlated with greater personal happiness, physical health, a stronger sense of purpose in life, avoidance of depression, and a greater interest in personal growth. The, the, just, the, just the study alone says, doesn't, regardless of why or what's behind it, just being generous is good for your life. So there are blessings in being a generous person. But the point that Paul is making here is you don't give so that you get a better life. That's the wrong way to think about it. Maybe this little drawing, if we go to this next screen, will help us. Paul, essentially it works like this in the New Testament. God pours out his love and his mega grace into us, our hearts, so that we could be generous to others. And who are these others? And when you're generous to them, and they're connecting it back to God, this cycle repeats itself, you see? They say, oh, God's pouring his, his grace into my life through this person. I wanna do the same. Paul is saying you'll be enriched in every way to be generous on every occasion. This is what he's after. Now I know, I know, I know for some of you, you're thinking, look, we can, we're just barely making ends meet. I'm not, this is not talking about the percentage or the amount or the money. It's talking about the, the posture of our hearts. What have you received from God? Maybe I'm, I'm gonna flip it around. What have you not received from God in Christ. What is yours that did not come from the grace of the Lord Jesus? Can you think of anything? That's right, you should be quiet. <laughs> nothing, nothing. If you trace it back, all is grace, all is gift. All is being poured out into us. We are among the most blessed people on the planet in this culture. 
I, I'm not there yet, but I want to live a life that's free from smallness of heart, where I want to serve other people. I want to give to other people. I want to see people the way God sees them and think about how can I bless them. I want to freely give from what I've been given. And God wants that from his people. And he wants that for your life. Not because like he's stuck and needs a little more help financially. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He owns it all. But because he knows it will set you free. The pathway to purpose. The life he's called us to. So we're going to give you just a moment here as we, uh, before we close in this last song. And as we think about these six G's. Gathering for worship and sharing the gospel. Growing through the knowledge of his word and in prayer. Connecting in groups with other believers to encourage our hearts and hold one another accountable. Going and serving those near and those far. And giving generously. Where would you say, if you did a little self-evaluation, where would you say God is nudging you? Which of those six would you say, Look, I think this is where I'm, I most need to pay attention? Of course, all of us need all of them all the time. Myself included. Well, this is the life God's called us to live. Let's bow together. Lord Jesus, we, we thank you for these, the story of our spiritual ancestors, these first Christians. And we, like them, have experienced the great grace of your love and mercy and forgiveness. Paul says in Romans 5, you have poured out your love into our hearts so that it might spill over out of us onto one another and into the world. Lord, none of us have it all together or have our life perfectly in order, but you consistently invite us into a deeper relationship with you. We thank you for your grace. Help us by your grace to live like you in the world. We pray this in your name. Amen. Before the benediction and you're dismissed this morning, if you're here and you'd like someone to pray for you or pray with you for any reason, there are always members of our prayer team right out back in that glass room, the prayer room, who will meet with you and encourage you through prayer. Now, brothers and sisters, may you go filled with the grace, the mega grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you would be enriched in every way to be generous on every occasion, and through it, thanksgiving to God. Amen. And go in peace.